Syringe exchange programs are evidence-based programs that take syringes that somebody turns in, whether it be a diabetic, somebody who is an injection drug user, or somebody injects uh, HIV medications such as Fusion, and what happens is they bring these syringes into this program, and the program will then give them free syringes in return. What this does is it encourages people who use syringes to get rid of their dirty syringes so then their dirty syringes aren't reused in a community. And what they're proven to do is decrease HIV, decrease viral hepatitis B, decrease viral hepatitis C in communities and amongst those populations using those syringes, as well as also shown with uh, communities not increasing crime at all when this is going on. There's a lot of misconceptions that syringe exchanges actually encourage drug use and encourage crime, but actually it doesn't at all. And all the studies have shown that isn't the case. The other thing that they do is they normally have a whole run of the gamut of health programs at the site. So they're going to have HIV and hepatitis testing, mental health care, social services, housing referrals. Um, it could be uh, a food program so people can get a couple meals a day and also a place where people can go into a place uh, expecting non-judgmental care and when they receive the non-judgmental care we see really really great health outcomes over the long term and they're also really interested um, when they're at a program for a while oftentimes in getting into drug detox and we know people who are involved with a syringe exchange program have really high uh, success rates for getting into drug detox programs and having that detox work. So they're really great programs to have in a community and something that you know we really encourage people to go to if they have any syringe access needs. Syringe decriminalization is a policy where syringes are just decriminalized, meaning nobody is ever uh, can be arrested for carrying a syringe and they're really, both of those are really good policies for law enforcement because what happens is people carrying syringes no longer are afraid to say, I have a needle on me. And what happens then is we know in those places, according to one study, that 66% of, uh, there's a 66% decrease in law enforcement sticks. So it's just a really great way to decrease uh, law enforcement, accidental needle stick exposures. And the great thing about syringe decriminalization itself is it doesn't cost society a cent. Um, where, you know, that's a really good benefit for states that are looking to address this problem and don't want to incur any other costs, that's a very good solution. Moving on to uh, the next question is we wanted to know how can law enforcement support harm reduction in general? And why should they? Well, I think access to, to for a person who's um, a, a drug user or someone who uses a needle medically, access to a clean needle is just, it, it's going to reduce the chance that a law enforcement officer is going to be exposed or stuck. I mean, you, it, I would rather be stuck with a clean needle than a dirty needle, I'm sure. If that were to occur, anybody would probably choose the, you know, the lesser of the, of the demons. But, I mean, I think the risk... <sighs> In most officers' mind is that you know if there's a if there's needles are available, it's going to increase drug use, you know, in the environment, and it's just been proven that it doesn't do that. You know, I think, I think at the same time, if you know if you're offering people who have uh, an addiction problem a clean needle, then you're you're kind of letting them know that you care about their health, and that that might trigger them to also care about their health. And like, it, I think it just could possibly start the conversations going that this is important. You have this problem, but like, let's try to help you do it in the safest way possible. And I, you know, a lot of law enforcement officers I know that would be the last thing on their mind. But um, the risk is out there. When you know, when I first came on the job in 2002, um, it was also illegal in Chicago to carry needles, and I saw a lot of needles. And I ended up with a needle stick because they were just everywhere. And then somewhere I was trying to remember, I think in July of 2003, um, the city struck that down, and they 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 kind of wiggled it in a way that was very politically correct. Um, and it, you were supposed to carry a needle card with you, and you could go, there was like one or two places in the city where you could go exchange your needles, but um, I just, after a while, I just never saw them in the ways that I had before. They weren't stuck in, they weren't in the floorboards of cars anymore, they weren't in people's jacket pockets, they weren't in the gutter, they weren't in the alley. You know, they're everywhere. They were just, people would toss them down because they didn't want to be caught with them. Um, 
and then it just became a different kind of problem. People would have them wrapped up in needle kits, little diabetic kits. They would have them. They would carry them in a safer way. And so we really, really saw that on the streets of Chicago. That it just it ceased becoming a problem. The times when I would see them a lot would be if we would catch people in the act of using in a car, in a van, down by the lake, um, in a house. We, you know, maybe we were there for a domestic issue or something. Um, but it really, really worked. It definitely worked. What is a needle card? It was just a card. Um, that said, you know, Joe Smith is, uh, he can carry legally up to 20 needles. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, can legally carry up to 20 needles on his person um, at any time. Yeah. And that's, I'm just curious about that program. How did, is that given by, by a physician? Is it given by the... No, it was just a municipal thing. They'd go sign up for it. They didn't even have to have an ID. But it was just a little step that they made users, you know, it, they, they made them kind of jump through a hoop in order to get the card to carry the needle so that it was just one step. Um, to say, basically, they were registered with the needle exchange program. It really didn't mean anything. Well, you're also educating the uh, the person who has the needles. They're they're more aware of the fact that they have a needle, and they're because of that, it's on their mind, and right. they have to get a card to be able to carry it. So they're more likely to tell the police officer about that. Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great program. I hadn't heard about. I mean, it, you know, word gets around on the street when guys find out that there's needles out there, they can go get them. Go get them. Mm. I mean. Yeah, because oftentimes in places that don't have syringe exchanges, or if people live in a town and they don't know the syringe exchange exists, people actually have to buy those syringes. And when they find out they can get them for free, they all tend to go yeah. in to that them. place and mm -hmm. get it. And they also have, you know, safe sex equipment there for people for free, all kinds Absolutely. of different food, yeah. shelter. You know, there's all there's also access to drug treatment at those sites. So. A lot of people really like going there because they can get all that stuff. And once people find out about it, you know, it also makes uh, syringes have very little street value. Mm -hmm. And so people then will even pass out clean syringes to each other, to different people who wouldn't normally go, um, in order to ensure other people are injecting safely. Because injection drug users care because if somebody in their drug using circle gets it, then, you know, if they share any of the equipment, whether it be the tourniquet or shoelace that they use, or, you know, the cottons or the cooker, any of that, then it's less likely to get anything that has hepatitis B or C or HIV on it. So Definitely. they really encourage all their social network to go. Yeah, a lot of times with the, the needle exchange places, you could get a sandwich or yeah. someone to listen to you or you could get a test done or, you know, get some health care from time to time. So it was, it, it really worked. It worked yeah. very well in the city. Yeah, let's. I would just like to just chip in that I I think everyone everyone in this room is going to be agree with the fact that that there is nothing that's more important than the notion of 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 safety and going home at the end of the tour, going home at the end of your shift, going home at the end of the day. I think when you wake up in the morning, regardless of what plans you you set your mind on for the end of the day, be it if you want to take a long walk on the beach, or if you want to go to a movie, or if you want to sit down and watch television, or if you want to read a good book, or you just want to sleep the rest of the night away, that's your prerogative. And no one thinks that when they go to work, that they should be left in a situation where that can't happen, that can't come to pass. Um, I think safety oftentimes is played through a series of, what I mentioned before, just probabilities. And this is a little bit of a, like an offset way of thinking, but you know, if we, if we were to interact, if we were to just bring about things like syringe, syringe exchange or syringe decriminalization, and someone say, a law enforcement personnel would say, well, what difference is it going to make? I mean, what is that really, really going to do? Well, the reality of it is, is sometimes things in small doses starts to add up after a while. I mean, you could look at a baseball player. If he's actually hitting a ball and getting hit two out of every ten times that he's at the plate, for all intents and purposes, intents and purposes he's a mediocre baseball player. If a player now gets one more hit, one more hit out of those ten, he's actually borderline Hall of Fame for his career. And theoretically, if he can get one more hit beyond that, he's only one man. A man named Ted Williams has actually performed that in the past. So it's only a little bit of a change that can make a significant difference. And I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I was saying, well, what if I could play a fantasy world, a fantasy game where I can make a change, and you've been, you're still working, you've been working for 15 years in law enforcement, and I know safety is the utmost, utmost priority to you. I can pass a bill right now where I know there's this magic gun being made by either Ruger or Smith & Wesson or Six Hour, where basically this gun will always aim true. 
regardless of how you shoot it, where you shoot it, what situation you're in, whether it's dark, light, you can't see, you don't know what's going on, it will hit the target that you're aiming at and it will stay true to stopping that particular target. Okay, now, I'm going to work with the assumption that the only reason you would pull your gun, you pull your firearm, is if you're actually doing it to defend yourself. In other words, to increase the probability of your safety. So, would you be opposed to having a weapon like this? And he said, absolutely not. If it's going to increase my chances of being safe, why wouldn't I want it? You know, I said, wouldn't it even be more special if you could actually target it where you want to target too? So now you can legitimately just even stop your suspect and theoretically not cause any type of grave harm to that person. He said, that would be wonderful. So I guess the thought process would be is, well, why would I be opposed to something that could produce a 66 reduction, percent reduction in a needle stick possibility for me? any program that could produce that. It wouldn't make sense for me to be opposed to it. So I think, well, law enforcement personnel around the country, we need to really just rid ourselves of the scotoma and, and just broaden our perspective on what we're thinking as far as the ways in which we can go about improving our job and doing our job where we can do it in a way where it can become safer for us. There are just outside things that we haven't given thought to. I happen to believe that this is one of those things that we've just never really given thought to to say, well, this could probably just enhance my work environment. It can enhance my possibility of going home to my family in the evening. It can enhance the possibility that, that things won't happen to me. There's gonna be something that we obviously don't want to happen to anyone. So I actually was stuck with a needle shortly into my career. Um, I came on the job in December of 2002 and I came out on the street in July of 2003 and I was stuck that summer during my probationary summer. I was working on the west side of the city and um, I stuck my hand in a purse that I didn't look into before I before I stuck my hand in and I got stuck on a needle and it was it was a huge eye-opener for me at the time um, I didn't tell anybody that I got stuck I didn't tell my partner that day I didn't alert a supervisor I didn't do anything I just went on with the job um, that stop in particular ended up in an arrest and we had a bunch of paperwork to do we had a lot of things to handle and I didn't want to rock the boat I didn't want to you know cause a wave or, or or stand out in any way because um, I felt like I'd made a mistake. Um, it wasn't a very healthy decision. I put myself at risk for all kinds of problems. Um, I was exposed to God knows what was in the needle. Um, I don't know if there's any residue on it. I don't know if it had been used. I don't know anything about it. Um, and I, I learned later in my career that I, I had options. I could have I could have taken care of it right then and there. The the woman in question wasn't any danger to us at the time. I could have stopped and treated it. I could have washed it. At the very least, I could have put alcohol on it. And then when I got back to the station, cleaned it a little better. I could have done an exposure report with my supervisor. Um, but I just didn't have any information or knowledge that I could have protected myself after the stick. I obviously could have protected myself before, but I, um, I made an assumption about this person that she wouldn't have any paraphernalia on her at all, and that was a mistake. Um, so, you know, a couple of mistakes, as my colleague pointed out earlier, can one mistake can be dangerous, it can be deadly even, and I made several that day. I learned from them all, but um, I think it's, I think sharing stories like this and sharing information and knowledge is really key to educating other officers and letting them know, you know, you can learn this from my mistake, here's, here's what I would have done differently. I would have looked in the bag, I would have asked this woman if she had anything dangerous, anything that could hurt me, stick me, poke me. Um, open up my skin. Um, maybe she would have told me, maybe she wouldn't have, but if I'd stopped and looked around in her vehicle too, I might have seen that there were, there was other drug paraphernalia there. I think there was something in the floorboard of her car. Um, I was new, I was young, I was excited. Um, I might have been a little overwhelmed. It's a busy day, it was a hot day. It's very hot in the summer. Um, the west side of, the sh of Chicago is just rocking and rolling all the time. The radio's going off. There's constant things happening, fights and shootings. and. Um, a lot happening. So, you know, you're under a ton of stress when the, these things happen. Um, encountering someone, getting in their car, pulling them out of a car, searching them is the most dangerous moment you can have on the street, simply because you don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, from that situation, I got a needle stick, and it could have been really, really dangerous for me. I, I didn't contract anything. I've been tested many, many times since then, so I was really lucky. But I just want to kind of make sure that that doesn't happen to anybody else.